Oh, good morning, friends. Here we are. We made it. We made it. This is our final day together. Uh, This is our final day of this spiritual enrichment week. Don't cry because it's over. Be thankful that it happened. Um, Real quick, uh, before before I start, I do want to take a moment um, and I want to thank you all. Whether you've been here, I see some of you that have been here every single day this week or whether you're joining us here for the first time this week, I I want to thank you for for showing up, um, taking some time out of your busy school day schedule to come and meet with God and to hang out with me. I absolutely love what I get to do. And I love it even more when I get to do it with really, really cool people. And y'all are some pretty cool people. So thank you for allowing me to be here with you all this week. You all truly have made this week very, very special for me. Uh, But to be real with you, not every week is this special for me. My life is not always this great. Have you ever had one of those days? You know, one of those days where nothing seems to go right for you. Anyone ever have one of those days? Like, be honest. Come on. Your life's not perfect. Like, you ever have one of those days where you got to get up early for class, right? But then you set your alarm for 7.30 p.m. instead of a.m., right? So you get up and you can't shower because you're in a rush, so you look like a hot mess. Then, of course, you leave, and you're in such a rush that you don't realize that it's cold and raining outside, and you are wearing the completely wrong shoes, you have no coat, you have no umbrella, and so now you are a hot, wet, cold mess. But then you get in your car, and you start to head to school. You're a commuter in this story. (laughs) You get in your car, and you notice right away you don't have any gas, because your brother borrowed your car last night, and the little twerp left you on E, okay? So now you have to take a detour and go get gas, which of course makes you even later. But when you get gas, the pump is defective and you spill gas all over your pants. So now you're a hot, wet, cold, flammable mess. (laughs) And so now you're driving, right? And of course this morning, it feels like every other driver on the road. Every streetlight is conspiring against you to make you more late. People are cutting you off. You're catching every single red. And so you start speeding. But of course, then you get pulled over and you get a ticket. So now you're a hot, wet, cold, flammable criminal mess. (laughs) But against all odds, somehow, by some miracle, you made it to school. You run into class and you're not that late and your professor's like, where's your homework? So you turn to go in your backpack and you forgot your backpack. And for the rest of the day, you are a hot, wet, cold, flammable, criminal, failing mess. Has anyone ever had a day like this? Is anyone currently having a day like this right now? Pray for these people. Pray for them. Have you ever felt like life just had you under attack? Like life was just kind of beating you down everywhere you went? Like you had a season where it was just health problem after health problem, whether for you or your family, and you felt like you just lived at the doctor's office, and then at the same time, Your family hits a financial crisis in the same week that your best friend lies to you and your boyfriend breaks up with you and it's all just sort of happening all at the same time, right? It's problem after problem. It's roadblock after roadblock. And the question that I want us to ask today on this final day of our spiritual enrichment week is what do you do when you run into roadblocks? What do you do when it feels like life has you under attack and it feels like life is just beating you down on every side? For those of you who haven't been here all week, we have been walking through the Israelites' journey. Their journey as God's people left slavery in Egypt and begin to move forward towards the promised land. And we last saw the Israelites when they actually wanted to turn back and go to Egypt. They had gotten to this point where they were right next to, on the banks of the Red Sea, 
But they turned around and they saw Pharaoh's army coming after them. And that's actually where we pick up today. I'm going to be reading in Exodus chapter 14, verse 15. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. So these Israelites, they see this water in front of them. And they turn around and they see this powerful army behind them. And obviously they're feeling pretty trapped at this point. They're obviously pretty terrified because they think this is the end for them. And so what do they do? They cry out to God, right? They're like, God, please help us. God, please deliver us from this. And God's response is so savage. Like, (laughs) it's so good because he looks at them and he's just like, why are you crying to me? Sometimes I like to think that God has a little attitude with people. You know, like he, he looks at them, he's like, what you crying to me for? Um, maybe because you're God? Like maybe because you are all powerful? Maybe because you are almighty? You are supposed to be our protector? Help us! Why are you crying to me? <laughs> Move forward. Moses, raise your staff, start walking, and then see what I do. You see, there's some of you in this room, and right now in your life, you are waiting on a miracle from God. You are waiting for God to show up and do something. You are crying out to God to do something about your situation. You are waiting for a miracle, but God is waiting for you to move. You see, many of us, We treat our relationship with God like a 16-year-old treats dating. We think God has to be the one to make the first move, right? Like, we think that God's miracle has to happen, and then I will start following him. God has to prove himself trustworthy, and then I'll start walking with him. But I think so many of us would begin to see miracles happen in our lives if we would just find the faith to move before the miracle, to move in anticipation of the miracle. I think so many of us would actually learn what God wanted us to learn from a breakup if we would just move on from the relationship. I think that so many of us would begin to see God working in our future if we would just find the courage to step into it. You see, so often we think that the miracle has to come before our movement. But in reality, it's often when we find the faith to move forward, we actually step into a miracle. God doesn't always have to be the one to make the first move. And now that the Israelites are finally beginning to understand this, now that they are about to move forward, They're about to see their miracle. I want to continue reading, but I want to skip down to verse 19. In verse 19, it says, Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right hand and on their left. So just a few minutes ago, things didn't look too good for the Israelites, did they? Just a few minutes ago, Pharaoh's army had them cornered. Pharaoh had them trapped. Okay, there was water to the west, 
There were Egyptians to the east, and they had nowhere to go. They had no escape. But you see, what Pharaoh didn't know And what the Israelites were about to find out was that even though Pharaoh had them cornered, God had them surrounded. You see, it says it in the text. There was a cloud. God's Spirit was in front of them. And God's Spirit moved behind them. And then God drove the waters back on their right and on their left. You see, even though it looked like game over, Even though it looked like Pharaoh had them cornered, God actually had his people surrounded the whole time. What I'm hoping you're going to be encouraged by today is that you may have walked in here and you feel as though there are obstacles in your life that have you cornered, right? There there are difficulties, there are temptations, there are fears, there are circumstances that have you cornered. Failing grades have you cornered. Your family's financial situation, your mental health, your parents' divorce. I don't know exactly what it is, but what I do know is that life may have you cornered, but God has you surrounded. Even when it feels like there's no escape, even when it feels like life has us trapped, God has us surrounded. And it doesn't matter When God has you surrounded on every side, it actually doesn't matter what has you cornered. Because when God has you surrounded on every side, you can be standing in the middle of a raging sea and you're still walking on dry ground. When God has you surrounded on every side, you can be in a boat that is being tossed by a giant storm and God is walking to you on the water. When God has you surrounded on every side, they can throw you in a fiery furnace, but you won't even be burned by it when you walk back out. Life, it beats us up sometimes. But even when it feels like we're cornered, God has us surrounded. And and when I was a sophomore in college, actually, I, I, I really learned what this meant. I really learned what it looked like for God to have me surrounded. I took a missions trip. It was actually my first mission trip ever to Managua, Nicaragua. And we did some work there with a missionary named Pastor Dan. And what Pastor Dan and his wife do is they actually run a girl's home uh, in Managua near a community called La Chereca. And La Chereca is this, this very sort of destitute community that is built basically on top of a dump. And what Pastor Dan and his wife do is they go into these slums and they find young girls whose parents can no longer take care of them. Oftentimes it's because maybe the mother has developed some sort of drug addiction or the father has become really, really violent. And so what they do is they actually take these girls in and they give them a place to live while working with their parents and trying to get them to a place where where they can actually be parents again. And then they reintroduce the girl to her family. And so every day that we were there, we would go to La Chereca. We would go to the dump, and we would check in with some of these parents to see how they were doing. And every time before we would go into the dump, every time before we would do anything, like three or four times a day, Pastor Dan would always pray the same exact prayer. He would always pray, Lord, protect us. Go before us, behind us, above us, below us, to the right and to the left. It was like clockwork, word for word, every single time. And at first I thought, this guy's not very original. Like some pastor, right? Like, come on, come up with a new prayer. But one day I'm walking with Pastor Dan and we're walking through the dump and I find the courage to ask him, I say, hey, why do you pray that same prayer every single time? Why do you pray that so much? And what he said to me, he said, John, you know, the work we do here, it's actually very dangerous. He said, John, there's a lot of gang activity and violence that happens in this dump, and there are many people that do not like that I am here. I have had men try and attack me. I have had angry, drunk parents 
pull a knife on me and put it against my throat. You see, John, we need that prayer for protection. And I was like, whoa, Pastor Dan, you are so serious. And while I know that most of us, we are not spending each and every day walking into dangerous situations uh, like gang violence or the slums. I know that's not our situation. But I also wonder how many of us have ignored or run from God's calling because we were afraid or felt cornered by things that were far less dangerous than that. How many of us have refused to move forward in our relationship with God because we felt cornered by something that was far less terrifying or even far less real. But I want you to know that to this day, Pastor Dan, he walks into those slums every single day. He walks into danger because he actually believes and he lives his life as though God has him surrounded. And so ever since I had that conversation with Pastor Dan, I have started to pray that prayer more in my life. I've started to adopt that, even in my circumstances that maybe aren't as violent or turbulent. I actually pray that prayer every single time before I walk up on stage to teach. You see, sometimes I can struggle with some self-doubt and some insecurity about myself as a speaker, as a communicator, I think, oh, I haven't prepared enough, or ah, this message, it's really not good. It's not going to speak to anyone. I can start to feel cornered by those thoughts. And so just 15 minutes ago, over there, I prayed that exact prayer. I prayed, God, you go before me, behind me, above, below, to the right, and to the left, as a reminder that even when I'm cornered by insecurity, God has me surrounded on every side. Whenever I have a month in my work, those of you who don't know, I I sort of run my own ministry that includes doing stuff like this, traveling around and teaching, but also uh, online. I I create faith-based YouTube videos, and and that is not only my ministry, but that's also my job. That's how I provide for myself and for my family, and whenever I have a month where things are looking really tight financially and, and I start to get really worried. I feel cornered by every single bill. I feel cornered by every single expense that comes in. I have to remind myself, God, you go before me, behind, above, below, to the right, to the left. You got me. In the past few years, I have actually started to struggle um, pretty consistently with feelings of anxiety. I've never been a very anxious person at all, but for some reason, in in the last year or so, every time my wife and I get in an argument or every time I have a day where things just don't go my way, things just don't go as planned, I find that my mind starts to go down this sort of dark spiral and I feel this tightness in my chest and and my mood, my mood goes everywhere. And and in that moment, it feels like my whole life has me cornered. It, It feels like the end in that moment. But what I'm learning to do is, even in the moment where it feels like I am trapped, to remind myself of the objective truth. And I just pray, God, before, behind, above, below, to the right, to the left, You have me surrounded in every situation. Now, what does this look like for you? What do you do when you run into roadblocks? What do you do when it feels like life has you cornered? Well, I mean, you could pray Pastor Dan's prayer. It's a great prayer. You could pray your own prayer, but really what it comes down to is having the courage to say, I will surrender to the God who has me surrounded. Even when I feel like my anxiety has me cornered, I have to have the courage to say, I will surrender to the God who has me and that anxiety surrounded. 
even when you feel like your circumstances or, or a relationship or a hard trip or schoolwork, whatever it is, even when you feel like it has you cornered, I will surrender to the God that has me surrounded. Are you willing to say that, not only today, but each and every day, because I'm telling you, when you are willing to say that, when you are willing to live your life as though the God of the universe actually has you surrounded on every side, then you can move forward with confidence because you know God has gone before you. Then you can walk forward with confidence because you know God's got your back. You can move forward and you don't have to be afraid of the waters anymore because God is holding you on your right and on your left. He's got you on every side. And so I, I want you to just take a minute and in the time we have left, I want you to just really think what would your life begin to look like if you actually lived like God was protecting you on every side? I wonder what risk you would take. I wonder what thing that up until now you, you've been a little afraid to try I wonder how you might step forward because God's got you on every side. I want you to think, what, what would your life look like if you actually believed that God was sustaining you on every side? Would you maybe keep going? Would you not quit the thing that you've been so tempted to say, I'm done? Would you keep going if you knew God was sustaining you the whole time? What would your life look like if you actually believed and lived your life as though God was loving you on every side? How would that change the way you looked in the mirror? How would that change the way you nitpick photos about yourself? How would that change the way that you hear all those things that people might say? I wonder what slums God might lead you into to do good work. I wonder what seas, what oceans God would lead you across if you actually lived your life as though God has you surrounded on every side. 